Hello and welcome to the Chapter 9, Part 3 lecture on the reactions of aerobic respiration, also known as cellular respiration. You should use the information in this lecture to complete the Chapter 9, Part 3 guided notes, which of course you should complete before you attend class. In Part 2 of this chapter, we started discussing glucose metabolism, or glucose breakdown. Remember that the point of that process is to break glucose down through a series of steps, pull energy out of that glucose molecule, and use it to make ATP. Remember that glucose is like a $100 bill, whereas ATP molecules are like $1 bills. So ATP molecules are easier to spend one at a time than a $100 bill. Now in the last lecture, we took glucose through glycolysis and broke it down into two pyruvate molecules. And at that point, I told you that there are several different ways we can go with our pyruvates. In part two, we took it over here into fermentation, and we discussed how glycolysis paired with fermentation is a very effective method of making ATP if you're a small cell with low energy needs. Fermentation supports the process of glycolysis and allows those cells to continue doing glycolysis over and over and over again. Glycolysis makes two ATPs at a time from a single glucose molecule. So if two ATPs at a time is enough for you, that's fine. However, what about cells like ours? We have animal cells and they have high energy needs. We're very energetic cells. Two ATPs at a time is not gonna be enough. So what can we do? Well, this time we're gonna take our two pyruvates over here into the mitochondrion and take it through cellular respiration. Notice a couple of things about this reaction. First, it requires oxygen, O2. It is aerobic. This is the reason that we breathe oxygen, is to power this process. And the second is that it takes place inside the mitochondrion. So we're gonna to have to go in there to get this process started. Let's take a look at it. The endosymbiotic theory tells us that mitochondrion are essentially little bacterial cells living inside our own cells, and they help provide our cells with energy. There's some parts of the mitochondrion that you need to be familiar with before we get into the reactions of cellular respiration. Like all cells, mitochondrion have an outer membrane. This is just a phospholipid bilayer like we find on the outside of our own cells. Mitochondrion are sort of unique in that they have an inner membrane as well. They have a second layer in here. And this inside layer of phospholipids is folded into these little wrinkles that we call cristae. Now between the two layers is a space. So there's the outer, there's the inner, and you'll notice there's a little gap in between filled with fluid. We call that the inner membrane space. And some important reactions are going to occur there. The last part of the mitochondrion that you need to know about is called the matrix. It's this liquid in the very center inside the inner membrane. So that's the matrix. So regarding cellular respiration, where are we going? Well, we have our two little pyruvate molecules, and what we need to do now is to take them all the way inside the mitochondrion into the matrix, so into that liquid in the center. Now notice that in order to do that, we have to go through two membranes, the outer and the inner. Now because pyruvate is kind of large, it's going to need to be actively transported into the mitochondrion twice to get into that matrix that's actually gonna end up costing us a little bit of ATP um, at the end of the process. When we count up how much we spent and how much we made, this step costs us a little bit, but that's okay, it's worth it. You're gonna see, we're gonna make a lot of ATP. So let's head into the matrix and begin those reactions. The first reaction of cellular respiration is known as pyruvate oxidation. Sometimes it also goes by acetyl-CoA formation. Either name works. As the name implies, in this reaction, pyruvate is going to get oxidized or broken down. So it has three carbons in its backbone, but the product at the end is only going to have two carbons in its backbone. So this molecule got broken down. The remaining carbons that are left over get added to another molecule, and it forms this thing called acetyl-CoA. 
Also during this reaction, we have some CO2, carbon dioxide, that's released. And we release enough energy from that exergonic reaction to make an NADH. Let's take a closer look at it. Let's look at pyruvate oxidation in a little more detail. Here's good old pyruvate. Notice that it has one, two, three carbons in its backbone. Once the pyruvate enters the mitochondrion, it's going to go through a step wherein the top part, this top carbon with its oxygens attached, is going to get removed by an enzyme. That little molecule is going to form a molecule of CO2, which is going to leave. Now think about it. Every time we breathe out, we breathe out CO2, or carbon dioxide, right? Well, this is one of the sources of that carbon dioxide. Now the remaining product, that remaining two little carbon chain, is going to go inside the mitochondrion, and it's going to encounter this thing. This thing is called coenzyme A. It is a multi-enzyme complex, so it's a big complicated molecule. And the job of coenzyme A is really to grab that little leftover piece and carry it into the next step. So it's like a little transport molecule. That's all it does is deliver this to the next step. Here you can see that coenzyme A has grabbed on to the two carbon part that's left over. Sometimes a two carbon chain such as this is referred to as an acetyl group. So collectively we call this molecule acetyl CoA, and that's what's going to go into our next step. Now remember what happens whenever we break a big chain like this. When we take a three carbon chain and snap one of the carbons off into a two carbon chain, energy is released. That is an exergonic or catabolic reaction. So those energized electrons that are snapped off during this process are going to be numbed up by NAD+, and it's going to end up forming NADH. So the NADH becomes reduced and is energized, and we're going to use it later on. Notice that no ATP is made during pyruvate oxidation. There's one other thing you should notice about pyruvate oxidation, and that has to do with the numbers of molecules we're dealing with. This diagram shows a single pyruvate undergoing oxidation and forming a single acetyl-CoA. But remember that from our original glucose molecule, we actually had two pyruvate molecules to work with. So if we have two pyruvates to start out with, we're going to end up with two acetyl-CoAs total. So this reaction will repeat twice. We're also going to end up harvesting two NADHs from this process. And it requires two coenzyme A's, and it makes two CO2s. So remember that total through this reaction, because it runs twice, we have to double the numbers of all of our molecules, if we're keeping track of them, which we are. As this mountain biker heads up the trail, the breakfast he ate this morning is being burned to power his bike ride. His breathing rate increases as his leg muscles demand more oxygen to burn more fuel. Let's zoom down to where this fuel is burned, our cells. Here, the blood vessel on the left delivers fuel and oxygen to a single muscle cell. In cellular respiration, energy in fuel is converted to ATP, shown here as starbursts. Most ATP is made in the cell's mitochondria. ATP powers the work of the cell, such as contraction. Let's take a closer look at how ATP is produced from a molecule of glucose, our fuel. Only the carbon skeleton is shown to keep things simple. The first step is called glycolysis, and it takes place outside the mitochondria. To begin the process, some energy has to be invested. Next, the molecule is split in half. Now, the molecule NAD+, an electron carrier, picks up electrons and hydrogen atoms from the carbon molecule, becoming NADH. Keep track of the electron carriers. They play an important role by transporting electrons to reactions in the mitochondria. In the final steps of glycolysis, some ATP is produced, but not much. For every glucose molecule, only two net ATPs are produced outside the mitochondrion.
However, glycolysis has produced pyruvic acid, which still has a lot of energy available. Let's follow this pyruvic acid molecule into a mitochondrion to see where most of the energy is extracted. As the molecule enters the mitochondrion, one carbon is removed, forming carbon dioxide as a byproduct. Electrons are stripped, forming NADH. Coenzyme A attaches to the two-carbon fragment, forming acetyl-CoA. Coenzyme A is removed, and the remaining two-carbon skeleton is attached to an existing four-carbon molecule that serves as the starting point for the citric acid cycle. The new six-carbon chain is partially broken down, releasing carbon dioxide. Several electrons are captured by electron carriers, and more carbon dioxide is released. The carbon dioxide that you exhale comes from the reactions of cellular respiration. Two ATPs are produced by the citric acid cycle for each molecule of glucose. At this point, only a small number of ATPs have been produced. However, more energy is available in the electrons that are being transported by electron carriers. While the citric acid cycle starts another round, let's follow an electron carrier to the next step in the process. Electron carriers such as NADH deliver their electrons to an electron transport chain embedded in the inner membrane of the mitochondrion. The chain consists of a series of electron carriers, most of which are proteins that exist in large complexes. Electrons are transferred from one electron carrier to the next in the electron transport chain. Let's take a closer look at the path electrons take through the chain. As electrons move along each step of the chain, they give up a bit of energy. The oxygen you breathe pulls electrons from the transport chain, and water is formed as a byproduct. The energy released by electrons is used to pump hydrogen ions, the blue balls, across the inner membrane of the mitochondrion, creating an area of high hydrogen ion concentration. Hydrogen ions flow back across the membrane through a turbine. Much like water through a dam, the flow of hydrogen ions spins the turbine, which activates the production of ATP. These spinning turbines in your cells produce most of the ATP that is generated from the food you eat. The process you've just observed, cellular respiration, generates 10 million ATPs per second in just one cell. That ATP can power a biker up the trail, or it can power your brain cells as you learn challenging biology topics. The next major step of cellular respiration is the most complicated. It's a big giant cycle known as the Krebs cycle, or sometimes called the citric acid cycle. This cycle actually consists of eight different steps catalyzed by eight different enzymes, um, but we're going to keep it pretty simple. Essentially what happens in this cycle is that this molecule from the last step, acetyl-CoA, is going to go in, it's going to be affected by a number of enzymes, and a number of different energy products are going to be harvested and made, including NADH, FADH2, and ATP. This is the last step of glucose breakdown, so this is the last point at which we can get any more energy out of that original glucose molecule. A waste product of the Krebs cycle is CO2, which again we breathe out. Let's take a closer look at the Krebs cycle. The Krebs cycle can be broken down into three phases. Let's introduce each one. First, the acetyl-CoA from the last step is going to join up with a molecule known as oxalacetate, and a molecule known as citrate will be formed. In the second phase of the Krebs cycle, the citrate is going to be broken down through a series of steps, and energy products will be formed as a result. In the third phase of the citric acid cycle, that four carbon intermediate that we end up with is going to get recycled back into oxal acetate so it can start the cycle over again. Surprisingly, this uh, recycling step will actually release a couple of energy products for us as well. Let's take a closer look at each phase. Here's the first phase of the Krebs cycle. There's two major reactants. 
oxaloacetate, and the acetyl-CoA molecule that was formed in the last step. Here's our little acetyl-CoA molecule. Now the coenzyme A molecule that delivered it here is going to drop it off, and then that guy's going to leave and go back to the previous step to pick up more acetyl groups and deliver them to the Krebs cycle. So he's going to leave. That leaves us with the acetyl group, which is a two-carbon molecule. It has two carbons in its backbone. Now here's oxalacetate, which is kind of fun to say. Notice that it has four carbons in its backbone. When the acetyl-CoA and the oxalacetate get together, they end up forming this molecule, citrate. And if you look at the molecule closely, you'll see that it has six carbons in its backbone. Now that makes sense, because four carbons plus two carbons equals a six carbon molecule. Citrate is also known as citric acid. So that's the reason for the other name for this cycle. It can be called the Krebs cycle after the scientist that characterized it, or it can be called the citric acid cycle, because citrate is citric acid. In phase two of the Krebs cycle, citrate from the last step is going to get broken down a couple of different times so that energy can be harvested out of it. In this first step of the second phase, citrate, which is a six carbon molecule, is going to get broken down into an intermediate that only has five carbons. So in other words, a carbon was snapped off of the backbone. Now where does it go? Well, it leaves as CO2. That's a waste product that we breathe out. Now because that reaction is exergonic, because we broke something, energy is going to be released. And guess who's going to capture it? Good old NADH. This reaction is going to happen again. This intermediate, and don't worry about learning its name, it's going to start with five carbons in its backbone. A carbon is going to be removed, so we're going to end up with another intermediate with only four carbons. Again, because a carbon was removed from the chain, that carbon is going to leave a CO2, which is waste, and energy is going to be released, which can be snatched up by NADH. In the last phase of the Krebs cycle, that intermediate that we were left with, which incidentally is a four carbon molecule, is going to get recycled back into oxalacetate. Now oxalacetate is also a four carbon molecule, so no carbons are going to be added to the chain, but stuff is going to get rearranged around that backbone through a series of steps. Now it might surprise you to learn that these steps are actually exergonic. These are catabolic reactions that happen through this rearrangement. So energy is going to be released. Now who's going to grab up our energy for us? Well, there is an enzyme present that is capable of substrate level phosphorylation. In other words, it's going to take an ADP and change it into ATP for us. So we make an ATP, that's great. Other enzymes are also present that will make an FADH2 becomes reduced and is filled with energy, and at another point an NADH is going to get filled up with energy as well. At this point, oxalacetate has been recycled, so that cycle can start over again, and it will repeat over and over and over again as long as the cell continues to need ATP. That complicated Krebs cycle was a lot of work, so what do we get out of it? Well, first let's look for each acetyl-CoA. One acetyl-CoA enters the cycle at a time, and from that, the following are made. Two CO2s that are breathed out as waste, one little ATP, and incidentally, this ATP is made by substrate-level phosphorylation. That means that a little enzyme took an ADP and a phosphate and squished them together, if you remember. We also managed to make three NADH molecules and a single FADH2 molecule. Now remember that this cycle actually has to run twice in order to harvest the maximum amount of energy from the molecules we have at hand. And we had two acetyl-CoA, so it'll run twice. That means you have to double the numbers. From the two acetyl-CoAs that we got from breaking down glucose into pyruvate and pyruvate into acetyl-CoA, we actually end up with four CO2s, two nice ATPs, six NADHs, 
and two FADH2s. So this process is useful because you harvest a lot of these energy carriers and you actually get to make a little ATP, which is the point of this process. The Krebs cycle actually marks the end of the glucose breakdown part of this metabolic pathway. So at this point, we've broken glucose down as far as we can go, and we've harvested as much energy out of it as we can. Before we move on to the next step, let's assess where we are. First of all, let's look at ATPs. How many ATPs did we make through all these steps? Well, we only made four. We made two profit in glycolysis and two in the citric acid cycle. So that's pretty good, but it's not nearly enough to power an energetic cell such as an animal cell. So what else do we have to work with? Well, let's look at our energy carriers. NADH, we managed to make 10 of those guys. We made two in glycolysis, two more in pyruvate oxidation, and six more in the citric acid cycle, so 10 total. We also managed to make a little FADH2. We only made two of them from the citric acid cycle, but they're going to be handy too. Now NADH contains enough energy to make two and a half, approximately, ATPs. So we can make quite a bit of ATP out of the energy in these NADHs. There's also enough energy inside an FADH2 molecule to make one and a half ATP molecules. So we can use that energy to make some more ATP. Well, how do we do that? For that, we're going to need a machine. We're going to feed these energy carriers into a big machine known as the electron transport chain. And that chain is going to convert that energy from the carriers into ATP energy. Let's take a look at it. This giant machine is the electron transport chain, or the ETC. This is the machine that's going to harvest all of the energy from all those nice little energy carriers that we've been building up through all these steps. And it's going to build it into a giant pool of energy that can be used to make ATP. Now before we get into the steps of how that works, let's talk about where we are. We have been in the matrix of the mitochondria, so in this fluid kind of in the center. But the ETC is actually built onto the inner membrane of the mitochondria. Remember that the mitochondrion has two membranes. So if that's the inner membrane, this might be the outer membrane. The ETC is here, and there will be multiple electron transport chains built into this inner membrane. The electron transport chain consists of a series of proteins built into the inner membrane of the mitochondrion. So if we're looking at this diagram, here's a protein, here's a protein, here's a protein, and so on. And these proteins all work together to make this machine work. Many of the proteins in this chain are known as cytochrome proteins. And all living things have to have these electron transport chains, these cytochromes, to survive because they all have to make ATP to survive. As with any machine, this machine has to be energized or turned on before it can do its job. So let's talk about how the machine is energized. Now remember that our energy carriers, NADH and FADH2, were reduced when they gained a couple of electrons. So they took energized electrons out of other molecules as those molecules were being broken down. That's how they became energized. These little energy carriers are now going to drop off those energized electrons into some of the proteins of the chain. So NADH is going to drop off two of its little electrons into this chain. FADH2 is going to drop off its little electrons into this protein. When they do that, they become oxidized again. So they become emptied of that energy, and they have to go back and be re-energized again, start the cycle again. It's the electrons that actually give this machine energy. What will happen is that the electrons will be dumped into the proteins, and then they will travel from one protein in the chain to the next. They actually get handed off. So this first protein will hand it to the second one. The second one will hand its energized electrons to the third one. This one hands it to the fourth one, to the fifth one, and so on. 
So it's kind of like a game of hot potato, if you remember that from when you were a kid, where you're passing an object quickly from one thing to the next, keeping that energized reaction going. As the electrons travel through this chain, they leave a little bit of energy behind. So the electrons at the beginning of the chain have more energy than the sad little electrons at the end of the chain. As electrons in the electron transport chain near the end of the chain, somebody has to be there to catch them. I mean, you can't just have electrons flying off into the inside of the mitochondrion. Electrons are extremely reactive, so they can cause a lot of problems if they're by themselves and unattended. So that's what this big reaction is about. You have to have a molecule present that's willing and able to catch the electrons as they come out of the chain. In fact, these electron catchers actually pull the electrons out of the chain, and it keeps the electrons flowing through. Let's talk about some different electron catchers. Different forms of glucose metabolism use different end chain catchers at the end of their electron transport chains. Aerobic respiration, which is what we've been talking about, uses oxygen gas, O2. This is really the reason that we breathe oxygen gas. Without oxygen gas, the electron transport chain shuts down and we die. Now the oxygen gas is actually going to break down through this reaction. It's going to interact with those electrons coming off of the chain. It's also going to interact with some hydrogen ions, and it's going to form H2O, water, as a byproduct. Anaerobic respiration is the metabolic pathway that some prokaryotic cells use to break down glucose and other sugars. The key word here is anaerobic. Using this pathway allows these cells to grow in oxygen-free environments. Now why is it anaerobic? Well, that means that it can't use O2, oxygen gas, as the catcher at the end of its electron transport chain. Different forms of these pathways use different molecules. Instead of O2, they might use CO2. Some of them use SO4, methane, and other types of organic molecules. So now that we've energized this machine, we need to discuss what it actually does. What work does it do? Well, this machine is actually a giant hydrogen pump. It's a proton pump. Remember that hydrogen ions are also known as protons. So what this thing does is as the energized electrons flow through it, it grabs hydrogen ions from the matrix, this is the matrix in here, and it pumps them across that inner membrane into this little space over here. Now remember that there's another membrane over here that mitochondrion have an inner and an outer membrane. So this space here is the inner membrane space, IMS, the inner membrane space. The hydrogens are getting pumped from the matrix into this little space. Now as this happens over and over again, a gradient of hydrogen be begins to build up. The hydrogen ions are getting really, really crowded. And we learned back in chapter 7 that when molecules are crowded like that, they're unhappy. They want to diffuse. They want to move. So by crowding up these little hydrogen ions into the intermembrane space, what this, uh, what this machine is doing is actually building up a big storehouse of energy that can be used to do more work. The electron transport chain has been pumping these hydrogen ions into the intermembrane space. So it's been creating this giant gradient of hydrogen ions. Now these ions are pretty unhappy. They want to move. They want to diffuse. So they can do some work. How are we going to use these guys to make ATP? Well, that's where this enzyme known as ATP synthase comes in. Here it's this pink and purple thing. ATP synth synthase is a big machine. It's got moving parts. We'll take a look at it more in just a moment. But essentially what it can do is it can allow hydrogen ions to flow back through it from the intermembrane space back into the matrix. And as those charged particles flow through the enzyme, that energizes it. That gets its parts moving. And what its parts will do is take ADP and a phosphate and stick them together into ATP. In other words, ATP synthase phosphorylates an ADP into ATP. This machine makes ATP. 
and it's powered by that hydrogen gradient. Up to this point, we've depended on substrate level phosphorylation to make a few ATPs for us along the way. In fact, up to this point, we've only made four ATPs. That's not very many. Hopefully you can see how this method is different. This method of phosphorylation is known as oxidative phosphorylation. It's much more complex, but it's much more efficient. I mean, look at this thing. This machine uses an electron transport chain, a hydrogen gradient, this big enzyme complex with moving parts, and it doesn't just make one ATP at a time, it makes a bunch of ATPs at a time. So it's much more complex, but it's also faster. That's oxidative phosphorylation. Here's a more detailed diagram of ATP synthase, and it is flipped upside down from the last diagram. Look at this thing. It has parts that rotate around like a carousel, it has parts that rock back and forth, and it makes ATP. Pretty complex. How does this thing work? Well, hydrogens are going to flow into this thing through a channel from the inner membrane space, and as they flow in, they're actually going to kind of hop on this little carousel. The little carousel is going to rotate around, and once they've made a rotation, they're going to flow through the rest of the channel and out of the enzyme. So what this does is it translates chemical energy into rotational or mechanical energy. That rotation on the top will make this part on the bottom, which is called a lollipop head incidentally, rock back and forth. And these parts that are rocking back and forth are the parts that will actually take the ADP and the P and mash them together into an ATP. So as long as this thing is rotating, it's going to be cranking out ATPs. We say that ATP synthase uses a proton motive force because it is supplied with energy by hydrogen ions flowing through it. How many ATPs can it make? Uh, there are estimations, but approximately 28 to 30 ATP at a time. Pretty good. Here we have the whole electron transport chain all put together. Let's go through it one more time. First, we have the energy. Energy carriers, including NADH and FADH2, are going to drop off their electrons into this chain. The electrons will flow through the chain from one protein to the next until they pass out of the other side. They leave behind their energy, which is what energizes those proteins and allows them to do their work. At the end of the chain, gases such as oxygen gas are going to grab those electrons, interact with some hydrogen, and form water as a byproduct. Now what work did the chain do? Remember, it's a hydrogen pump, so it's going to grab hydrogen ions floating around in the matrix and pump them into the inner membrane space, forming a hydrogen gradient. Finally, the hydrogen gradient is going to be used to power ATP synthase. As these hydrogens flow back from the intermembrane space into the matrix through the enzyme, it's going to energize it and it allows it to change ADP into ATP, which is the product we were looking for. I'd like you to complete this your turn before you come to class. In this your turn, you're going to examine this diagram of the electron transport chain, and you're going to describe what you see happening at each step. See if you can figure out what this diagram means. It's very similar to the other diagrams we've looked at. In part one, I'm looking at this reaction right here. I want you to tell me what you see happening there. Part two, it's a little hard to tell. I'm looking for this thing happening here, these little circles that are passing through these big purple blobs. What's going on there? In three, I'm looking for this reaction here. In four, I'm actually looking at the red and yellow arrows going up. I want to know what's going on there. In five, I'm looking at this big red arrow coming down. I'd like to know what's happening there. And in six, I'd like to know what's happening with this reaction at the end. See what you can figure out. How many ATP molecules are made through this long metabolic process? 
Well, most estimates say that from the energy in one glucose molecule, we can make between 36 and 38 ATPs. However, that's if conditions are ideal. If everything runs perfectly, we might get 36 to 38 ATPs. However, there are some factors that can decrease the amount of ATP that's made. Let's talk about those. First of all, remember that the exchange rate between our energy carrier molecules and ATPs are not whole numbers. There's enough energy in an NADH to make about two and a half ATPs. And there, remember, there's no such thing as a half ATP. Same thing with FADH2. There's enough energy there to make one and a half ATPs. No such thing as a half ATP. So it's an estimated value. Second, when we bring NA, uh, the pyruvate into the mitochondrion from glycolysis, it has to be actively transported through two membranes to get into the matrix. Active transport requires ATP. So in order to even get the reactants to the reaction, we have to burn a little ATP, and that takes a little bit out of our profit margin. Finally, the proton motive force is not 100%. What does that mean? Well, that means that the electron transport chain is actually leaky. Sometimes hydrogen sneak through that membrane back into the matrix without going through ATP synthase. And because they don't go through the enzyme, they don't energize it. If they don't energize it, it's not going to make quite as much ATP. So there are some costs associated with these steps. This slide illustrates the theoretical yield of ATP that we can get at each step in the process. Each NADH has enough energy to make two and a half ATPs, and each FADH2 has enough to make one and a half ATPs. Also, in steps such as glycolysis, we have some ATP that's made, also in the citric acid cycle. So when you add all of that together, you end up with a total theoretical yield of 32 ATPs from this process. All of these different estimates differ from one another. How much ATP do we make from the energy in one glucose? Well, the truth of the matter is that we make about 30. 30 ATPs are made from the energy in one glucose. That's pretty good. So I told you before to think of glucose as a $100 bill and ATPs as about as $1 bills. However, keep in mind that that's just an analogy that the exchange rate between a $100 bill and a $1 bill is not going to be the same as in uh, these molecules. One glucose is equivalent to about 30 ATPs, and that's pretty good. The energy transferred from a glucose molecule into those 30-ish ATP molecules actually represents about 34% of the total energy that was present in that glucose molecule. So about a third of the energy was transferred and captured. The rest of that energy is going to be lost as heat, but even that energy isn't useless. That's the heat that helps keep our bodies warm. That's the heat produced by digestion. Now 34% may not seem like a lot, but let's compare that to a combustion engine. The average car engine uses about 25% of the energy present in the gasoline that's burned in the engine. So we're at least a little more uh, efficient energetically than the average car. That's pretty good. This metabolic pathway is primarily used to break down carbohydrates such as glucose for energy. However, carbohydrates aren't the only game in town. Other types of molecules, including proteins and fats, can also be broken down for energy. When proteins are broken down for energy, they have to first be broken down into amino acids, and then those amino acids can enter at different parts of the cycle depending on what kind of amino acids have been made. They can enter at the point of glu glycolysis, or they can enter the citric acid cycle and be broken down. Fat molecules contain a lot more potential energy than the average carbohydrate molecule. So fats can also be broken down for energy. However, fat breakdown is a little bit more complex than carbohydrate breakdown, which is why your body will break down carbs before it accesses your fat and burns fat on your body.
Fats can be broken down into glycerol and fatty acids, and those molecules can enter this metabolic pathway at different points and be broken down further for energy. Whoo, you guys, you did it. You finished big old chapter nine. You should now feel confident enough in your knowledge of ATP that you can finally go out and get that ATP tattoo that you've been wanting. We'll see you in class.